the next speaker is Alex uh, Creighton. Alex is, the me is a member of the Rust core team and has been working on the Rust programming language for five years. He is employed by Mozilla to work on Rust and works throughout the project on aspects such as the standard library, cargo, the asynchronous I.O. ecosystem and the infrastructure of Rust itself. Currently, Alex works primarily on the Tokyo project in Rust and asynchronous I.O. stack, as well as Cargo Rust's package manager. Now, what you don't know about Alex is that his uh, favorite indie time travel movie is called Primer. Have you seen it? Have you seen Primer? Okay. So one day, Alex, he says, he's actually going to understand what happens in the movie. But before he does that, he's going to deliver his talk called Concurrency and Rust. Let's have a big hand for Alex Creighton. All right, thank you. So yes, uh, my name is Alex, and today I would like to talk to you about concurrency in Rust. And so Rust is a new programming language coming out of Mozilla Research, and I'll be giving you a, uh, a little bit of an intro to that uh, more in depth tomorrow, but also a little brief one today so we can kind of get started. Uh, first off, what I would like to talk about is kind of why we're talking about concurrency and why concurrency is so interesting today, especially in the realm of C and C++. And so this is a graph of a bunch of data collected over uh, 40 years of just kind of CPUs and the various trends among them and a couple of different properties. But there's two that actually show out in high, high detail here, the first of which is this aspect that CPUs are not getting faster. CPUs have flatlined over the past decade, and this whole Moore's Law where we're going to double our CPU speeds every uh, six months or a year at this point, that's all out the window and that's not going to work anymore. But the other trend we see is that we have this exponential increase, or we see a very large increase in the number of cores available on your machine. So we can't make everything faster, but we can add more of it at the same time. And so it's our job as programmers, if we want to kind of keep up and make our programs continually faster and faster, to make use of all these resources, to actually use all the cores we have available to us, and to actually kind of make sure we're doing that in a productive fashion that's not accidentally crashing all of our programs. So this sounds great, and so we'll open some bugs, and so this is actually a real bug on the Firefox rendering engine saying we should parallelize CSS selector matching. And so that's, that's easy to do, we, but the problem here is that this bug was opened seven years ago. So for seven years, this bug has remained inert, saying all of these possible speedups, all of these possible benefits of kind of using all the concurrency on the hardware, we haven't been able to take care of this. And the reason for that is that Firefox is a multi-million line C++ code base. And we run into this issue, which uh, is perfectly depicted by this sign, and uh, actually, this is massive, so I don't really need to blow it up, but there's this sign in the San Francisco office of Mozilla, which is, uh, I think it's like three or four meters in the air, saying you have to be this tall to write multi-threaded code. And it's really showing off this aspect where to actually use concurrency in a language like C or C++ is incredibly difficult, and especially in a multi-million line code base, trying to retrofit that in there and trying to retroactively add that is a next to impossible task. So we have these bugs that are open for seven years with no one actually making any progress because we're never sure when we've fixed it or we're actually complete and when we don't have any bugs. And so this is where Rust starts to enter the picture. This is a blog post entitled Fearless Concurrency in Rust, which came out just before Rust 1.0 was released a few years ago, and is showing that when you, uh, the programming language of Rust is kind of directly targeted at solving this problem, of kind of freeing you from these ideas of you don't have to worry about data races or seg faults or all these issues you see in C and C++, and you get a compile time guarantee that when you compile code, none of these issues exist, and that allows you to kind of have the freedom to actually use all of the cores in your machine and actually make use of all the resources that we have available to us nowadays. So before we go much further, I want to give you a brief overview of Rust itself. Like I said a little bit earlier, I was talking about these strong safety guarantees, these no seg faults, these no data races, which is kind of the, th the thread safety aspect, but also this without compromising on performance. You get all these safety guarantees with the same level of C++, or the same level of performance as C++, and kind of that same underlying architecture of compiling down to the machine, having raw access to the machine code, no runtime. 
And all of this kind of comes into this package of confident, productive systems programming. This is kind of a slogan which we've been using for Rust nowadays, where the systems aspect is very similar to C++ at being low level, but the safety and kind of all of the uh, aspects of Rust that are providing you the, the freedom to not worry about these seg faults and data races gives you this confidence to actually be more productive and to actually do more than you would, be, would do otherwise in other languages. The perfect example being that Gecko bug, which has actually been solved now, and I'll be talking a little bit more that, about that in a bit. So in this talk, uh, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about concurrency, just kind of make sure we're on the same page of what it is and kind of uh, give you an, an overview of what I mean by this. I'll give you a bit of a small intro about Rust, so it's okay if you've never heard of Rust before. And then I'll dive into the libraries. This is kind of what you can do with concurrency in Rust. Some of the primitives we have, how they work, and how we actually make them safe using the guarantees that Rust has. And then finally, not entirely concurrency related or a little bit different is futures, specifically about asynchronous I.O. and the kind of the what Rust story is that for today and kind of how that all works and a, a bit of a deep dive and kind of how that's implemented and how it's so fast. So all right, this is kind of the Wikipedia definition that you'll see for concurrency online, which is a lot of fancy words, but in general it just means that you have a bunch of actors executing at the exact same time or kind of slightly interleaved, kind of a lot of stuff happening all at once. And so we can kind of take a look at an example of this with a small C program which just calls fork and prints out the result. And if you haven't seen fork before, it just uh, creates a new process on Unix and returns twice, once in the parent process and once in the child process. And so this could print zero in the PID that was actually returned by fork, or it could print out the PID and then zero. And this is showing that kind of just the smallest fundamental unit of adding concurrency to a program already starts creating this kind of exponential growth of states in our program that we have to worry about. And so this is what happens where when you start adding threads to a much, much larger program, it's effectively impossible to understand all of the possible interleavings here. It's inf you can never fully comprehend how exactly every single state, and are they all gonna work, and are they all valid? And so this is where concurrency has all of these bugs associated with it, these data races, these race conditions, these seg faults. And some of these are actually exploitable which is really bad in the sense that if you're just kind of an innocent library maintainer and you'd like to actually use concurrency, you'd like to use the CPUs you have available to you, the problem is that if you do so, you might be opening up your users to CVEs, to remote code execution, to all of these vulnerabilities that are targeted back at you. And so this is uh, a real problem because concurrency is also super, super nice. This is actually that um, the parallelizing CSS matching in Gecko has now been implemented in Rust and is actually shipping, I think, in about 10 hours in the, when, when the US wakes up. And uh, we get these nice speed ups. So Amazon starts rendering for instantly almost 20% faster, and YouTube on some computers goes up to 30% faster. And so we have this problem where we, ha we have all these resources, and we want to use them because we get some clear speed ups and some clear wins but we're afraid of doing that because of all these problems, these data races, these seg faults, these race, these, these race conditions. And so this is where Rust starts to enter the picture, and I wanna talk about, uh, first to hear about the safety aspects of Rust, kind of how we actually fundamentally build up safety in Rust, and then that's gonna kind of lead into how we actually use those fundamental aspects to build up concurrency primitives as well. So Rust is a kind of, made of these two key ingredients, these zero cost abstractions, which you're very familiar with from C++, and then also this memory safety and data race freedom aspect. And so I'm gonna zero in here on this memory safety and data race freedom, kind of specifically how that actually works and how, what the fundamental concepts are within Rust itself. And to start off, I wanna show you a small example uh, written in C++ of kind of what I mean by safety. And as we do this, I wanna dig into what the bug is here and kind of what's going to happen. So naturally in C++, we'll start with the program here. We have a vector of strings. The vector itself is stored directly on the stack. And then uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll grab a pointer into it, then we'll push some data onto it and try and print it out. So as we come down here and we try and actually push some new data on the vector, those of you who have implemented vectors before or are familiar with this might know that, okay, this, this vector's length might equal the capacity, so now we need to allocate some new data, copy over the existing data, push some new data on, and then the next step is that we're gonna update the vector's data pointer. So the vector now points to this new chunk of memory and we're going to deallocate and free the previous chunk of memory. And clearly this is the problem that we're gonna see here, which is that we have this dangling pointer into freed memory now, our element pointer, which means that when we actually try and print this out, this is undefined behavior. This is, could do effectively anything at this point in time. It could segfault, it could actually succeed, it could then kind of do whatever, and this is what we explicitly want to avoid because these are the kinds of problems where you write it into your code, it works today, and then 10 years from now you get an email saying, oh, you broke my program and you're not around to fix it and I had to debug it for six hours or 30 hours to figure that out. But so in any case, 
I want to dig into here uh, kind of what actually happened. Like, why did this go wrong? And wh what can we learn from this? And how can we kind of generalize this to try and solve more problems than just this one specific issue? And there's two key ingredients. The first of which you'll find here is alias pointers. So we have this element pointer and this vector pointer, which are pointing to the same chunk of memory. And then the problem here is that that alone is fine, but it's when you add in mutations. So you have this mutation of the vector, kind of pushing on some new data. And it's this simultaneous act of both mutation and aliasing which is causing problems here. If you only had mutation, then the vector itself was always internally consistent. If you only had aliasing, then they're both pointing to the same piece of data and it's not changing, so it's totally fine. Typically, this is when a garbage collector comes in and saves the day, but in Rust, we have kind of have this constraint where we cannot have a garbage collector. We want this kind of systems level of performance, and we also want to have this lack of a runtime. And so Rust's solution to this problem of kind of preventing sim simultaneous mutation and aliasing is called ownership and borrowing. These two aspects, these, these kind of two pillars are the foundation on which all safety in Rust is built. These are kind of the two fundamental language features that Rust gives you. And I'll talk about these in some more detail, but at a very high level, the first thing that ownership and runtime, or ownership and borrowing gives you is no runtime. This is not a garbage collector. This is purely a static analysis. So there's no extra metadata tracking. There's no extra layers of indirection. It's kind of all ex executing as you actually wrote it and just running static analysis at compile time. We, as I've been saying, this is kind of the foundation for memory safety itself. This is how we're going to pre be preventing data races, how we're going to be preventing seg faults. Kind of this is where the threat, the threat safety aspect comes into Rust as well. We're kind of building off of ownership and borrowing. And it's really interesting to, to compare and contrast this in the sense that in C++, you have the freedom of not having a runtime, which makes it very embeddable, makes it very running in a very large number of contexts. But obviously in C++, you don't have memory safety. You don't have freedom from data races. Other languages like Java or Ruby or JavaScript, they have a garbage collector, which gives them memory safety, but they obviously have a very large runtime associated with them. It's very difficult to embed. It's very difficult to run in constrained environments. And the very interesting thing about these languages is that they don't actually protect you from data races. And so this is kind of the key aspect of ownership and borrowing, which is it's giving us all these benefits effectively for free and this, in the sense of uh, we have no runtime, we have memory safety, and we also have no data races. Sorry, I want to give you an overview of first ownership and then a little, little bit of borrowing. I'll talk more about these in the talks tomorrow, so this is going to be a, a bit of a fast tour. But So here, here's an example of some Rust code where the first thing we do is we create a vector on the stack. And as we saw with C++, the vector is stored directly in line, the kind of data, the length, the capacity on the stack itself. We have this uh, word mute here, which means that we actually can mutate the vector, saying, OK, well, now we can push some one onto it, we can push some two onto it, push some data onto it onto the heap. And then we're going to call this function called take. And so what's happening here is that on the right-hand side, we have this bare v of vec32. That's kind of like the, the type that it's receiving. And then we're calling the function take with the binding v. And what's happening at runtime here is we're transferring ownership, which means the function main is going to push a copy of its vector for take to have. So it's going to kind of make the copy of that data, the length, and capacity. Not the data itself, just kind of the vector on the stack. And then it's going to transfer ownership to the function called take. But simultaneously, as part of all this, the function main forgot about, kind of, quote unquote, its copy of the, of, of the vector. So it's not actually going to be able to access it anymore. And now, the other thing about ownership is that take as the sole owner of this piece of data. It's kind of the unique owner of that vector. When it executes and actually finishes, we know that it has gone out of scope. There are no possible owners of this data. So as the owner, you have contr control over the destruction of this, giving us deterministic destruct destruction in Rust, very similar to C++. And this is where you free resources, you close sockets, you free memory, you destroy everything internally. And so as we come back to the function main, this is where main no longer has access to this vector. It has relinquished ownership. It no longer can even touch this vector, which means that if we take this code and we add kind of an extra push on top of it, if we were, we were to allow that, this is obviously free data at this point, so this would be a use after free. But the Rust compiler will reject this, saying you have a use after move of an own value. And so this is where, the, again, this is a static analysis happening at compile time, which is preventing you from using anything after you have moved it elsewhere. But you have one owner, you can transfer ownership, and then as the owner of a piece of data, you can drop it and deallocate it and free it and do anything associated with that. So the next thing in Rust was borrowing. Oh, sorry. And the, uh, the key aspect of ownership I'd like to go through was the, uh, well, I was talking earlier about owner, or aliasing and mutation. We're trying to prevent both of these from happening at the same time, because that's where all these bugs are coming from. And so what ownership is doing is it's allowing mutation, but it's not allowing aliasing. 
So borrowing is kind of the other aspect of that, where if we only had ownership transfer, it would be kind of unergonomic to just keep passing everything around by value. So here we'll have a vector of, uh, on the stack as well. And the first kind of borrow of two in Rust is a mutable borrow, denoted with this ampersand mute on both the caller side and the callee side in this, in this push function. Now, a mutable borrow, as the name implies, does allow mutations. So as we come over here, we'll create a lightweight pointer. That's kind of what, what references are doing in Rust. And we'll be allowed to, to mutate this and actually push some data on, onto that vector. Now, because this is allowing mutation, a mutable borrow does not allow aliasing. So once you have acquired a mutable borrow, we are no longer allowed to modify this vector. So we can't read the vector. We can't create a new mutable borrow. We can't take a look at the length. All, this can only be accessed for a small period of time in this one region where we have a mutable borrow. But as we return from this function, as we return from push, this mutable borrow has gone out of scope. So now we can continue to read the vector and do what else we want with it. And the second kind of borrow in Rust is a shared borrow. And so this is denoted with this ampersand sigil on the right-hand side and also on the left-hand side. And a shared borrow allows aliasing, but not mutation. So we can create many shared borrows. We can read some data. But while we are doing that, we cannot mutate it. So this, this read function cannot push any, any, more contents, any more contents onto the vector. You can't create any more mutable borrows. But you can pass around all these shared borrows and whatnot. So all right, that was kind of a very quick overview of, state of ownership and borrowing. I'll be going in, in more depth to, tomorrow on this. But the key thing here is that this is all happening statically in Rust. This is kind of one static analysis pass, which is guaranteeing these, these aspects of never having simultaneous aliasing and mutation. And it's kind of preventing all these bugs where ownership, for example, is you never have a double free because only one person frees it and has the owner of it. And then borrowing prevents these use after freeze like we saw in C++, where once we had a borrow on that vector, kind of once we have the pointer into it, we're not allowed to mutate it. We can't say, OK, now update it behind the scenes, and we forgot to update one or the other. And so uh, well, the coolest thing here is uh, I've also been saying that Rust does not have uh, data races. And these are the three key ingredients for a data race, this sharing, this mutation, no ordering, kind of with a C11 memory model. You can gloss over that. If you have all those all at once, you have a data race. And this sounds pretty familiar at this point in terms of by preventing either aliasing or mutation never, never happening simultaneously, Rust kind of for free with these two systems frees us from data races. And we no longer have to worry about data races at this point. And so I'll, I'll show a few, uh, an example of, of this later. But it suffices to say this is kind of why Rust has no data races and how ownership and borrowing are preventing that purely by saying we should never simultaneously have aliasing and mutation. So all right. Now I want to kind of dive into, uh, given these foundations, or at least quick foundations, talk about some of the concurrency primitives that Rust has and how they're leveraging ownership and borrowing to actually give you these, this management of the, of the machine in a productive sense of not having data races, not having seg faults, and all that. So the key thing to know about Rust is that Rust's concurrency is all baked into libraries, not the language itself. Historically, we actually had message passing and we had a bunch of stuff baked into the language, but we ended up removing all that by only having ownership and borrowing. So what we're, what we're going to see here is actually purely baked in the libraries, either the standard library or the Rust ecosystem. And all, of it's do, all it's doing is leveraging ownership and borrowing to give you this ironclad guarantee of safety. And I'll, I'll be going over some examples of how that all works. So first thing we need to do is to actually introduce concurrency. We need to actually spawn a thread. We need to do something that adds a new actor to our system. So this is an example in Rust where we use the std thread module, which has a spawn function. This will just have a closure internally. That's that double bar and braces are a closure in Rust. In this case, we'll compute a valid world. And eventually, we can actually have a synchronization point waiting for that thread to exit. And so this, this is a relatively simple program, which will just print hello world. Now, what we can also do with closures in Rust is actually close over outer data. We can kind of seamlessly pull it in and start working with it. And this is an example where we're going to start by creating a vector on the main thread, but then we're going to transfer that vector to a child thread and then start actually modifying it. And the key, word here, the, the key thing here is this keyword called move, saying that we are moving the contents of the closures of this vector into the child thread. So this destination vector, it's starting on the main thread. We are then transferring ownership to the closure. And then that whole closure is going to go run on some separate thread. And because it's mutable, we can actually start pushing onto it, and it's going to all work out. But so what happens if we actually come here and try and add some modifications afterwards? This would be a typical data race if we actually were pushing onto this vector from two different threads. Or this might actually cause some internal seg faults. But Rust will prevent this at compile time, saying that's a use after move, because we have actually moved this content into the child thread. We no longer have access to the main thread. And so you can no longer touch it. You can no longer uh, get any, any data races that way. 
And then you might be wondering, well, what happens if we remove that move? What, what happens if we remove that move keyword? So this is a case where the closure here is actually only going to capture it by reference. And so with the borrowing system, this will actually work out in terms of we have a closure that refers to some vector and then we can actually push on the vector afterwards. But this would be a data, a data race or could uh, cause various problems at compile time or at runtime otherwise where if the main function returns before the thread actually starts, then you're gonna be using a vector after it's been freed. And so Rust actually gives you an error here saying that this value does not live long enough. And so this is where kind of the borrowing aspect also has these lifetimes associated with it where when you spawn a thread, you only you have to capture everything by ownership. You have to capture everything by value. You can't have any shared references in there or mutable references in there because they do not live long enough. And so this is one where uh, only, we can only actually successfully compile this code if we transfer ownership of the vector into the, into the actual closure that we're spawning or the main function no longer has access to it. But that's not always the most useful thing. So the first thing we might try to do is to actually share this data and kind of use it on both the main thread and the child thread is use reference counting. And so this is where we have this RC type, standing for reference counted pointers, where this is creating a new reference counted pointer with some vectors inside. And then inside the child, we're gonna try and print it out and then use it, on, use it externally as well. But the problem with this is that this reference counted type is actually not an atomically reference counted type. So this is just using plus equals one. It's not actually doing any, any instructions under the hood. And so Rust at compile time will say that this type cannot be sent across threads. And so this is another aspect where Rust is helping you in the sense that Rust internally has this notion of what types are sendable across threads and which are not. And we know that reference counted types, for example, that are not atomically managed are not safe to send across threads. So when we actually capture this V and we move it into the child closure, even though it was passed by ownership, kind of that one reference of it, it was not actually safe to mutate that reference kind of multiple threads, and so this is rejected at compile time. This is one where kind of whether or not a type is sent or is sendable or not sendable across threads is one that's automatically inferred by the compiler and kind of works out internally. So instead what we can do actually to actually successfully compile this, which I'll dig into some, some more detail here, is use this type called arc. Now this stands for atomically reference counted and naturally is therefore safe to send across threads as we're gonna be atomically managing the reference, the reference count so it's safe to fraud that on multiple threads at a time. So here the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take a vector, put it into an arc. That's gonna create some data on the heap, this kind of big blue box. We'll initially have a reference count of one because that's the, the one reference that is being returned and our, our V pointer is pointing to that. And then we'll have our data inside our vector of our one and a two. When we come here and call this clone function, what we're actually doing is creating a separate reference to the same reference count of data. So we'll have this, just this extra V2 pointer that is pointing directly at this ref count. It'll update the actual reference count to two, and then and now we can start uh, actually moving these and kind of moving them into separate threads. So our thread here is actually executing with the first reference, and when we try and actually print out the length of this vector, what's happening is that you're getting a direct pointer directly inside this arc. So you're kind of going past all the data, going past the reference count of data, that extra, extra header with the reference count, feel, reaching directly into the arc and kind of printing all that out. And there's some key things happening here in terms of how this ends up all being safe. The first of which is that arc, when you construct it, is taking ownership of the data as you pass it in. And so this is, this is key in the sense that we know that as the owner of this vector, there are no outstanding aliases. Ownership does not allow aliasing, so the arc here is the sole owner of this piece of data. And then as the sole owner of that piece of data, you can then decide how others get access to it. So for example here, an arc is only going to allow shared access because we have some aliasing with extra reference counts here. So with this shared access that arc is now giving us, we can now have effectively a, a safe program at that point. And so uh, because arc is atomically managed, when this thread exits and kind of when the other function exits, we'll come down here and we'll decrement the reference count to zero. At that point, we can start freeing all this memory and, and releasing that back to the system. And so I was saying earlier that we only allow shared references here, which means that if you accidentally were to say, oh, let me actually try and mutate the vector behind this, even though the memory is actually managed for you and with arc and atomically and actually correctly, this could still be a data race in the sense that the other thread may not be expecting you to mutate this vector at the same time, but arc is only giving you the shared reference. It's not giving you a mutable reference, and so this is preventing you at compile time from mutating the data behind this arc which kind of is, again, preventing those data races, preventing those seg faults, pre preventing these kind of classical concurrency bugs. But so this also isn't, we, we, we've been able to share memory now. We can share some memory between the main thread and between a child thread, but it's not too useful if we can't mutate it. So this is where mutexes come in. This is similar to a mutex or a lock in other languages. 
So mutex in Rust is denoted with this uh, mutex of i32, this kind of type parameter in here of what's inside of the mutex. And this is another thing like with arc, we are taking ownership when we create the mutex, which means that we are protecting this data inside of the mutex. And as the sole owner of that piece of data, it is now arbitrating access to the underlying content. So you, you must go through the mutex to actually try and acquire it. And so this is kind of like, we'll have a, our blue mutex box, which we'll say is originally unlocked. Our counter just kind of points to the outside with some data inside of it, and we'll just say it's a, a zero for now for this integer. So the first thing, and the only thing that you can do with a mutex is lock it. And this is kind of codifying the, a, the necessary pattern that most people would agree that if you have data protected by a mutex, you should only access the data if you've actually acquired the mutex itself at that point, if you've actually gone through that. And this lock function is going to return what we call a guard type. And this guard is actually a proxy through which you can actually internally access the data. So here we'll lock our mutex. No, one, no other thread can exit at this point. We, we blocked and made sure that no one else is, is accessing this. And then through data, we can now directly access the underlying contents of the, of the integer here. And so we can add one to it. We can update our zero to one and kind of do whatever we like to the actual underlying data. So again, this is using uh, ownership to make sure that once you put data inside of a mutex, you have to access it through the mutex. There's no outstanding aliases. There's no outstanding references. There's no other way to touch that data. And now once it's inside there, you can only touch it after you've locked the mutex. Kind of the only safe operation is you wait for all threads to, to not be touching the mutex, and then you have access to, to read it, to modify it. You can get a shared or a mutable borrow from this guard type. And also, as I was saying earlier, we have deterministic destruction in Rust. And so this guard as an own type, we know that it's coming out of scope here at the end of the function. And so naturally, you're just going to unlock the mutex and allow some of the threads to come in there and actually modify it and do whatever they like to it. So this is one where, very similar to C++, in Rust you will explicitly acquire resources, so you'll lock a mutex, you'll allocate some memory, you'll open a file, but you very rarely explicitly deallocate references. You just kind of let them fall out of scope. So the locks here, you just let it fall out of scope. You never deallocate memory, you just let it fall, you just let it fall out of scope, like the vector we saw earlier. So the next thing I want to talk about is that we not only have mutation through mutexes, those are some little heavyweights sometimes, so we also have atomics where these are very similar to C11 or C, uh, uh, at atomics with the same memory model. And the key thing here is that we, ha we do not declare this number as mutable. We're actually mutating this through a shared reference. Now, that sounds kind of bad in terms of Rust was all about preventing simultaneous aliasing and mutation. But the key thing here is this is still not a data race in the sense that one of those ingredients was no ordering. But you can only access these atomic variables with some ordering, this seek kist here, this seq, CS, cst is kind of sequentially consistent. And so once you have atomics, you can have atomic fetch adds, atomic swaps, atomic loads, atomic stores, kind of all you would expect from C11 or kind of that, 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 mem that atomic memory model, you can do in Rust as well. And this is a little bit lighter weight to share, to share mutable memory amongst threads than just having a mutex all the, all the time. So the last thing that I want to talk about in the standard library itself are these MPSC channels, these ability to send messages across channels and the ability to kind of pass these own values between threads. And so previously, we've, we've been mostly looking at shared memory concurrency, where you have a big chunk of data, probably managed with an arc or some other different memory management scheme, and then you have some sort of internal mutability with atomics or mutexes, or it's just being shared concurrently amongst a bunch of threads. But message passing is also quite useful sometimes in terms of uh, it, it's a much easier to par paradigm to work with. You don't have any extra sharing of memory. It kind of d depends on, on like the application at hand. So to start out, we call this channel function in the MPSC module, which creates a TX and an RX half, standing for transmission and receiving, for sending messages and receiving messages. With these two halves, we can actually clone the TX half. This is the MP, the multi-producer. We can't clone the RX. That's the single consumer aspect of this. And so we have all of these pointers that are pointing to kind of the same chunk of memory, the same channel in memory, and these are kind of just managed externally. We'll start up two threads that are kind of going to send a five and a four, and so we've now isolated one of our, our TX in one thread, our TX2 in another thread, and then these messages will return, will be actually, will come to us in some non-deterministic order. We'll say it comes in a four and then a five. MPSC channels are FIFO, first in, first out, in the sense that the, this will print out four and five, kind of whatever order they come in will actually come out in the same order on the other side. 
So once we've actually freed the, TX, the, T, the TX and the TX2, now we know that the channel is now closed because it can no longer actually receive any messages at this point. No one else can possibly send messages in. And so we can actually iterate over all messages left here and kind of atomically close the channel and atomically uh, handle, handle all the messages and free all the resources associated with that. So that's kind of an overview of what the standard library gives you, these kind of multiple, multiple paradigms of shared memory concurrency, message passing, kind of whatever fit, fits the bill for you. We have a couple of various tools there. But the actual concurrency story in Rust goes far beyond just the standard library. It's kind of just what we give you. But the aspect of this is, again, this is all using ownership and borrowing. Kind of everything you've seen here is just building on these fundamental language concepts and giving you these concurrency primitives. And this can be done externally as well in the ecosystem. So Rayon is a crate, or a library, which we call it, in the Rust ecosystem, which is kind of primarily focused on giving you very easy access to the concur concurrency available and kind of making very easy to add parallelism to your program. And I could give an entire talk on just Rayon, but as, a, as an example of this, we'll start out here with a small function that just kind of iterates over a list, squares everything, and sums it up. And this is only uses one core. It's kind of just running on, on one machine. But if you have a giant, giant list, you might actually want to execute it on multiple cores at the same time to kind of make use of all those resources. And with Rayon, all you have to do is take this one function called iter and switch it to a call to par iter, which stands for parallel iteration. And so that's the kind of the key aspect of Rayon is very, very lightweight concurrency. And so what will happen here is this will divide it into big chunks, throw it all at a bunch of uh, work stealing thread pool of threads and kind of do this all in parallel on the machine. And then we've had some very, very nice benchmarks with, with Rayon in terms of it's very, very productive con for concurrency and does a very good job in terms of slicing this up. The work stealing kind of nicely spreads out the load and everything. And there's a whole lot more you can do with, with Rayon itself, but this is kind of just a, a taste of how on the, on, once you actually get outside the standard library, we have kind of further abstractions that are all leveraging these, these underlying language primitives and what's in the standard library as well. Uh, the key thing, though, about Rayon is that what I saw you is not too, too hard to implement, especially in C++. You can have a library that has all these work stealing aspects. But the, the real benefit of doing this in Rust is that you might forget at some point that this is a parallel iterator. You might forget that this is actually running across multiple threads. So you could introduce a bug here by saying, oh, well, let me just count up every time this map, this map function happens. But obviously, this is a data race. This is, cannot actually be shared safely amongst a, a multiple threads. This is not a, atomically updating this local counter. And so the key aspect of Rust is that this is rejected at compile time with this error saying that this variable cannot be shared concurrently amongst multiple threads. So again, like we were seeing with a standard library where you cannot misuse these, these fundamental primitives, it's the same with the ecosystem. You cannot misuse Rayon. If your code compiles, then you know there are no data races, there are no seg faults, no double freeze, none of that stuff you'll have to debug anymore. And so the last crate that I want to talk about is a crate called Crossbeam. This is a crate in the crates IO ecosystem, which is uh, primarily targeted at actually porting algorithms from GC languages into Rust. And so the problem is that there's been a lot of concurrent data structure research, but it's primarily done in languages like Java, which have a garbage collector, which notably means that most of the research, most of the algorithms, most of the data structures do not explicitly deallocate memory. They kind of assume that there's some garbage collector to take care of that. And so what Crossbeam is doing is giving this technique of epoch-based memory reclamation, which is kind of like a mini GC, just kind of localized to this one crate. And so it's making, us, making it very easy to port these libraries from other languages like Java and kind of put them into Rust and I implement them there as well. So inside of Crossbeam, we'll find these work ceiling decks that Rayon was using. We'll find MPMCQs for multiple consumers, which is a kind of extending the standard library aspect as well, and a whole bunch of other uh, things built up on this internally. And so again, to kind of wrap up the, the library aspect of a concurrency in Rust, the, the key thing here is everything we just saw was 100% safe. There's no way to misuse these. You cannot get a data race. You cannot get a seg fault. No matter what you do, this is code is going to compile and run as you expect it. And yes, all right. So uh, now I want to actually shift gears a bit to talk about features instead. So this is more of not so much the concurrency aspect on the machine with multiple cores, but more so with asynchronous I.O., kind of having that aspect of uh, lots of high-scale high servers, lots of various actors there, lots of TCP connections and all, all that good stuff. And so again, we have the, um, the Rust, Rust the language itself is the one that's actually fueling the shared memory parallelism with ownership and borrowing. We have the ecosystem with kind of all these extra paradigms. We saw mutexes and locks and arcs and channels. And features are kind of the async I.O. story in Rust, kind of this aspect of 
you're not necessarily running in parallel, but you have highly concurrent with tons of, tons of connected clients that you have to be managing all at one point in time. Now, async IO is obviously a very contentious topic and a very, uh, very, very, very exciting space with lots and lots of development happening all the time. And so I want to focus specifically on Rust's story here in terms of what we're providing and kind of how we're leveraging features and how we're actually building all this up internally. And I always like to start with this graph in terms of this is how we actually published the, the first iteration of features that we implemented. Or this is a simple benchmark of just kind of a hello world HTTP server where you say get slash and it returns hello world back to you. The y-axis here is request per second, the x-axis is a bunch of different frameworks. And the one here on the far left that's super tall is actually features written in Rust. And so this, what this is showing is that we've created servers with these features that have the utmost highest performance that we can possibly like, squeeze out of, out of these servers. And so this is something to keep in mind where I'll be talking a lot about how everything is features. We have features all throughout the stack. But the key thing here is that this is not quite the same as, language, or as features you'll find in other languages. They end up being not quite as costly, not quite as expensive, and end up giving us this level of performance. And this is kind of showing off the, the zero cost abstractions and kind of the, the possible performance you can get from Rust as well. <clears throat> so I want to start off by talking a little bit about just async IO itself. And so, uh, the first thing to talk about is synchronous I.O., kind of the, the contrast of async I.O., where you'll, eventually you'll tell the kernel, I have a TCP socket, I'd like to read some data into this buffer, and the kernel will block your threat. You'll be prevented from executing anything at that point in time until some data is actually received on the socket, at which point the kernel will say, all right, you got four bytes. I filled it in for you, and you can now go and progress with this. In contrast, though, what async I.O. is doing is you ask the kernel, I'd like you to fill in this buffer, but it immediately tells you, oh, that would block. I can't actually do that operation, and you'll have to go and figure out when to do that later. And so this is, ends up being much, much more difficult to actually work with, where now we know that no I.O. ever blocks, but we're going to have to somehow dispatch these events otherwise, where we'll have some interface to the kernel saying, okay, well, I'd like to block my thread now because I have nothing else to do, and then eventually the kernel will tell you, okay, well, while you were waiting, I had these 30 events come in. I have socket 5 is readable, socket 6 is writable. You can Th these bytes have been transferred, kind of all, all, all that good stuff. But then you as a user are now responsible for actually figuring out where do I put all these events and how do I actually execute that and what, is, what does this actually translate to in terms of executing my code. So for example, you have this kind of high level request. You just want to fetch the contents of the Rustling homepage. But this is actually quite involved in terms of what's happening here. You're not only opening a TCP socket, but you're doing name resolution. You might have TLS with, with encryption. You might have some sort of compression here. You're decoding HTTP. You're kind of doing all of this internally. But all the kernel gives you is this, oh, OK, file descriptor 5 is ready. Now it's up to you to figure out how to do that. And so this is where previously kind of working with asynchronous I.O. tends to be very, very difficult, very, very difficult to compose. You have one library that kind of works and one other library that works, but you're not really quite sure how to fit these together and kind of how to mesh them. And so we can, we want, what we want here is the way for two libraries to be entirely independent and then start working with one another, but all still built on this asynchronous I.O. aspect. And so this is where futures come into play, where a future is kind of a sentinel for some other value being computed on a separate thread. But the, the key part about a feature is it's kind of like an object or an object-oriented aspect to this where it internally is capturing everything necessary to actually compute that feature. So you know that you have a feature of a string or a list of bytes, but you have no idea how it's being computed. It's kind of abstract from you at that point. Like internally it knows how it's being produced, how it's being executed asynchronously, but you as the consumer just know that at some point you're going to get a list of bytes and you're, or you're going to get a string. And this primarily allows us to start actually doing this composition that we wanted to do. A future, for example, we can say, when that's done, I'd like to run this. I'd like to sequence some computations, just kind of run things one after another. We can also say, I'd like to execute these two things in parallel and wait for them to, bo wait for them to both finish. Or maybe I'd like to wait for one and not the other. And so this is very difficult to do sometimes, where I have this high-level concept where I want to fetch some homepage, like wrestling.org, but I want to give it a timeout. I just want to very quickly throw on some timeout on the, on, on the side of that. And what Futures is doing is giving us this level of composition, giving us this kind of interface where it's actually almost trivial to do those high-level operations. And so this means that if you actually come and say, I would like the wrestling homepage, 
instead of kind of these weird arcane things what we're getting out, we get, all right, here's a feature of a list of bytes where internally this is doing the DNS, the name resolution, the TCP connections, the encryption kind of, everything internally here is now captured inside of that one feature and you can now kind of just sequence extra data onto this. You can say, okay, well now that I have this object that represents this computation, I can continue interposing that <clears throat> or composing that with, with other operations. All right, so this is a bit of an, uh, this is an example of what it actually looks like with using features without IO kind of, but before we've actually touched TCP or DDNS or anything like that. So first thing we'll have here is we'll just have some sort of thread pool and we'll spawn some computation onto that. Or we're gonna say, just go calculate the 100 Fibonacci number. This result though is an actual future to an integer. So this result is kind of representing that an integer will eventually come here, but it, uh, internally it's just happening concurrently and then that'll get resolved once that computation is actually finished on that remote thread. In the meantime though, this immediately returns. So the, 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 the number is actually being computed on some remote thread so we can do some other aspects. We can get a coffee or do, or do whatever. But then eventually we can actually come down and say, I'd like to wait on this. I'd like to actually block and say, please give me the value inside of this future. And then we'll do the necessary synchronization to say, okay, now I'm gonna wait for that thread to finish and or if it's already there, it's gonna peel it out for you. And then once you actually have it, this result is now an integer and you can start working with it and doing whatever you like with that. And so the, uh, the interesting part come here, comes here now with how do we actually deal with features and IO? So we have all these TCP objects, this async IO, this DNS stuff we wanna work with, but we also wanna package it up in features. And in Rust, this is done with a library called Tokyo, which is kind of pulling together these two existing libraries in Rust called Mio and then the futures crate itself. Where Mio is, you don't have to worry so much about the internals of it, is, but it's effective to say that it's a cross-platform async IO library. Where, for example, on Linux, you have ePoll. You have uh, like this, this, this one interface to actually talk to the kernel and then uh, get events out of it. But on OS X, it's KQ, which is slightly different. And then on Windows, it's IOCP, which is entirely different. And so what Mio is doing is providing this small shim, which looks like ePoll, and is otherwise a, a, as small a shim as it can be on other platforms. And it's kind of where all the platform-specific logic goes. And then Futures is kind of basically saying that, okay, now that we actually have all these underlying IO primitives, we can start building Futures with TCP sockets and UDP sockets and kind of all, and all, all that good business. So Tokyo is kind of this package giving you fueling, giving you all these IO primitives to build up these features and kind of have that all be an internal logic to implement those features themselves. Because it's using Mio, it works across all major platforms, doesn't have to worry about uh, IOCP versus ePoll or anything like that. And this is Rust's implementation of an event loop, which is actually blocking the thread, what's dispatching all these events and kind of what's doing all, all that internally. The futures crate today has a number of various abstractions inside of it. So we have a future, which represents kind of one value becoming available. We have a stream trait, which means that multiple values are coming over time. This is similar to kind of RxQs or kind of reactive programming in Java or JavaScript. In, in a sense, streams are very pull-based. So we have syncs, which is the dual push-based. So you can push data into them. But the key thing here is that Futures gives you a nice toolkit when you're working with it as well. So you have these one-shot channels for I just have some computation on, on another thread and I wanna make a future to complete that and push it over here. Well, we have channels as well, so we can have a stream of values being produced over time. And then Rayon, like I was showing earlier, not only gives you data concurrency, but also gives you these future aspects as well where you can spawn some work onto a thread pool and say, I'd like a future to the result. And you can start composing that and doing all that internally. So with features, you'll find kind of a nice library integration and kind of a nice set of tools to immediately get off the ground running. Another important aspect of features, which you'll, you, uh, those of you coming from JavaScript or C Sharp know, or Python know is absolutely vital to working with, with Rust or working with uh, features, which is async syntax, async await. So in Rust, we have this async attribute saying this function is actually returning a feature. It's not returning a result, but it's kind of internally being transformed to a state machine that is going to actually compile down and kind of into one nice feature being returned. Internally, we can use this await macro, which is saying that I would like to block on the value of this feature, but not actually block the thread, just block my own personal feature itself and kind of man manages all the concurrency there for you. We have early returns where you can just immediately return from a function. You don't have to kind of have any extra fluff around that. And then we also have handling of async streams where you can kind of iterate uh, over time, over every, value, over, over every value coming on the stream and collect all the data in the vector, collect all the data from this HTTP request and kind of package all that up. <clears throat> 
And so this is kind of a key aspect of making futures-based programming kind of very approachable, very nice to actually use in, in, in Rust itself, where if you're only working the futures, you tend to have callbacks or combinators that get kind of unwieldy pretty quickly. And so this is a, a, a nice aspect of making this much more approachable and much easier to read, much easier to write and maintain over time. The Tokyo crate that I've been talking about has a number of primitives as well. It not only has, uh, it has a, a, some or organization internally and then, but effectively what's what it gives you is kind of all these bare primitives that you would expect of TCP, UDP, name pipes, processes, signals, and a number of protocols as well, such as HTTP and HTTP2, WebSockets and all that. So the key thing here is the, like, you have a, a nice package to get up and ground running pretty quickly. We've seen this deployed in production in a couple of companies and kind of uh, using it all internally and using it to a, a lot of benefit. So that's uh, mostly what, what I want to talk about, about Tokyo and uh, futures itself at kind of a high layer. But I want to switch now, uh, switch gears a bit to actually how we implement these futures and how, the, how this is all actually happening under the hood. And so here I want to try and build up this concept of a future from scratch in Rust. I was showing you earlier that we have this very, very tall bar showing that this entire stack is indeed quite fast, but I want to show you a deep dive into how futures work, how they ended up being designed, and kind of why some of the classic pitfalls of uh, other languages, we, we, we managed to avoid those as well. So to start off, first thing we might try is making a struct. This is just kind of a struct future with some generic type parameter that we're going to get out of it. But the key thing here is that, as we said struct, we have now said it's kind of like a class in C++. This is the one implementation of futures that we'll ever have, which that's not necessarily something we can always declare. This might be a thread safe implementation, and we might not need thread safety. This might be some kind of coordinated implementation that allocates memory, but I might not, I might, I might not even need to allocate memory. And so having just one implementation of a future is actually not going to cut it. We need some extra flexibility here, extra flexibility here to say, oh, well, I know how to implement a future for my very, very specialized scenario. And so instead, we're, we're going to use what in Rust we call a trait. A trait is similar to an interface in Java or kind of like a, a type class in Haskell, if you're familiar with that. But it's suffice to say that it's kind of a collection of types that all implement a common interface. And so what this is going to allow us to do is implement a future for any number of types that are all having their own internal implementation. We just have to say what's available. We have to actually fill out this trait. Where first thing we'll have is just some item there saying this is the actual uh, type that we have that we're actually going to resolve to. But then what are we actually going to put as a method here in terms of how we actually implement this future? And if you think about it, a future what I was saying is a sentinel for a value being computed at some point later in time. And so the first thing we tend to think of, and actually this is how it's implemented in most languages, is to have some sort of callback-based solution. Where this, what this function is saying is I'll have a function called schedule. It'll take the receiver, the actual future itself, and then a callback. That's this uh, fn once business, where the callback receives this t, which is the actual item being produced in the future. So here we're basically saying, when the future is done, run this callback. The problem with this, though, is we have this kind of bracket f and this bare self, which I'm not going to go into too many details here, but it basically means we can't do virtual dispatch. We cannot erase the types. We have to always kind of use this as a bare value, and there's nothing to really abstract over multiple different kinds of features. And so sometimes that's not always the, or you don't always need virtual dispatch, but I want to make a brief digression to kind of explain why virtual dispatch is so important here in the, con in the context of futures. So this is an example function where we'll just say we have some computation we're going to cache. We have some key, and then if our cache has it, we're going to immediately return that, saying that we are now done with that. But if it's not in the cache, then we'll go and compute it very, very slowly, and then that'll actually fill in the cache later, and return some different feature. But the problem is that this doesn't actually compile. We have one branch of the if statement returning one type of feature, and now we have the other branch of the if statement returning a different type of feature. And so in Rust, you know, to have a well-typed program, you have to return the same type in all branches. And so the way to solve this, we might think, is, OK, well, let's just add what we call an enum in Rust, where an enum is like a tag union in C or a tag union in C++. And it effectively just says you have multiple variants of kind of one type, where we can say, OK, well, the left-hand side is returning the A variant or the left-hand variant. The right-hand side is returning the B variant or the right-hand variant. And then we have this kind of implementation of a feature for this either type, which kind of just dispatches internally. And so this will compile, and this will work, and this actually works for this one particular use case. 
But the problem is we might actually add some extra code here. We might add some more ifs. We might add a whole bunch of ifs there. And it's kind of unclear how scalable this kind of adding an enum solution is going to be, kind of adding this static dispatch aspect, where do we get to AA, do we get to ZZZ? It's kind of unclear where this stops. And so what we really need here and kind of what we really want is this, uh, is this notion of virtual dispatch where in Rust, this is done with this box aspect, where so box here stands for heap allocated, so a box of T is just a heap allocated version of T. And so this box of future means that it's a heap allocated future that is virtually dispatched. So we have erased the type, we no longer know what was actually underneath there, but we can know that we can call it through some virtual dispatch and then go and actually use the future itself. And so this is kind of an example to show how important virtual dispatch is in, in working with features and why we need to enable this in the trade itself and kind of why we need to be catering to this use case. So what we can do is, given this trait definition, we can tweak it a little bit, saying, okay, well, let's remove this little f, let's remove this bare self, which I'm not gonna go into details of why that's not safe for virtual dispatch, but sufficient to say that this aspect is, where we have this ampersand mute and we have this box, which kind of is a allocated closure on the heap. But that's a very important aspect where now, instead of having uh, just kind of a bare closure in memory, we now, we only are compatible with closures allocated on the heap. Now, that's a uh, not immediately obvious as to why it might not be desirable. So what I wanna talk about here is uh, make another digression of how we expect to see servers built with futures and kind of how we expect futures to be used in the ecosystem. And so the idea here is very similar to Finagle and, uh, and, and Scala that kind of Twitter has produced. Where the idea is that every server is a function from a request to a future of a response, kind of this asynchronous function here. And all of your logic is gonna go internally. And so you might have a request that's kind of, you receive a request, and after that you'll load some inf information from a database, you'll do some RPCs, you'll do some more database requests, and finally you'll re render a response. Internally what's happening here is that a bunch of these aspects, each of these states are features. So loading from a database will take some time, so it has to be a future. An RPC takes some time, so it has to be a future. And so we'll take a look at this from kind of a state machine diagram or kind of a state transition diagram. Well, we'll start with a get slash, well then we'll do some SQL queries, some extra RPCs and whatnot. Internally what's happening is we're boxing all this up, not, not literally boxing on the heap, but kind of like putting this wrapper around this saying, this is our future that we are returning. Kind of our server is entirely representing kind of the internal processing is represented by all of these happening together. So internally in the one feature that we're returning is kind of this is how it's working internally, or kind of this is how it's actually being e executed. Now, we're, to actually implement this, what's happening is we're using this schedule function saying that when a future is done, we're going to execute some more data later on. So for example, once we have the original request, we're going to issue the database load, and we're gonna say schedule, when the database is finished, I wanna use that to start actually issuing the RPC. Now, when the RPC is finished, I'd like to schedule again to go move to the next state, and so on and so forth. And the key thing here is that between all these state transitions is where we're executing the schedule function. Kind of the schedule primitive is being used to transition between states of the future. In this case, we have five states, but internally we kind of have even more states possibly. So our server itself is kind of one giant feature that we are returning. Internally, that has many, many features inside of it. And then internally of those, and kind of externally as well, we have tons and tons of state transitions, which kind of means very, very quickly, the number of state transitions that we are accumulating is very, very large. And the key thing here is the schedule function, we have that box parameter, which means that every single state transition is now an allocation. We have to allocate some callback to say that to progress between states, this is how we actually execute that. And so overall, this ends up being very, very costly and kind of having uh, not quite the runtime performance we, will, we would like. And so originally when we had that very tall graph, it was much, much smaller when we were kind of doing all this allocation and, and internally. And so that, that was kind of the primary thing we wanted to solve. But there's this other threading related aspect which is a little bit more subtle and not always readily apparent when you talk about features and have you have these callbacks. And the thing to note here is that we have this closure here which we did not say whether it was send or sync which in Rust is a way of saying, we don't know whether it's sendable across threads, or we don't know if we can invoke it multiply on, or kind of concurrently on multiple threads at a time. And this is very important for futures in the sense that we don't actually know, can we, how are we going to execute a future where the result is being computed on one thread, and I'm actually consuming it on a different thread. So 
We can actually only do that if we add in the send bound here, saying this closure can be sent across threads. But then that incurs even more costs where what if we didn't have that? What if we only had one thread? By requiring this one closure to always be sendable across threads, now we're in this conundrum where now we have extra synchronization where we otherwise wouldn't need it. And so dealing with this ends up being very, very difficult in terms of how we make futures thread safe, how we make them appropriately non-thread safe in a sense for th single threaded scenarios to not have too much overhead and too, too many costs associated with them. And so for all these reasons, this is why we ended up not actually going along with callbacks. Not only are they far too slow, but they also have these drawbacks of with the threading scenario, we have these issues where they're too fast, they're too slow, or they just, we, we can never strike the right balance there. So we're back to the drawing board, and the, it's helpful now at this point to actually enumerate what we've gone over so far, where first thing we saw is features have to be a trait. We have to say that there are many implementations of a feature. We can't suffice by saying there's only one, and everyone's got to use it. Similarly, though, once we have a tree, we kind of have this interface, it must support virtual dispatch. It must support the ability to erase the types to some point where you have no idea what's underneath that box, what's underneath that feature. It's kind of anything internally. But similarly, we've noticed that there, the kind of the way we envision building these features, there are many, many state transitions happening in any one server. And so that aspect of this needs to be very, very cheap. And namely, it cannot involve any allocations or kind of moving all this data across these threads. And then finally, this thread safe aspect is one we would also love to solve as well, saying that we don't want it to require any extra gymnastics in the non-threaded scenario, but also still work in the threaded scenario to make sure that it actually can work on a server like that. So uh, to kind of, I'll make one, one, one final digression before we get to the actual solution, which is to take another look at what's happening here and see if we can kind of look at this architecture and extract some commonalities for kind of how we might be threading this needle. So we have our feature of response here. We're kind of this one nice package of what we're returning from our server, kind of how we're actually implementing that process function. But we can zoom out a little bit even further in saying that there's actually more happening in the server other than what's happening internally here, where we have, we're actually reading bytes from a TCP connection, we're decrypting that, we're decrypting or decoding HTTP and then doing the opposite on the other end. And so all of these aspects are kind of happening in addition to what we are running inside of our server itself. But then this is kind of where it ends. We can say that for, for example, one connected TCP client, this is kind of literally everything they're doing. It's nicely all packaged up. And so we call that a task. We can say, well, okay, we have this nice boundary, we have this nice delineation, so we'll just give that a name and we'll see what we, see what we can do with that. And it turns out server, we can actually zoom out even a little farther and say that well, a server actually has tons of tasks executing concurrently for many connected clients, for many connected various aspects of the server. And so uh, we've seen that a task that we're talking about is composed internally of many, many features, kind of IO-based features or just server-based features that you implemented yourself. And then the key thing, though, is that all these features, kind of as they're manufactured and destroyed over time, over the lifetime of that one TCP connection, was all connected to the same task. This task we're going to want to be the actual unit of concurrency, kind of like a, a green thread in a sense, but not in the same implementation aspect, just kind of in the... Uh, semantic aspect of we have these kind of lightweight threads, lightweight units that are being executed concurrently. And especially with async await syntax, it actually kind of looks similar-ish, but we don't have to deal with stacks or anything like that. So we'll come back here to say, all right, well, our callback-based solution on this trait didn't work, so how are we actually going to do this? And it turns out the next thing we might think of is, okay, well, instead of saying when you're done, do this, what if I ask you just are you done yet? We can say, have this function called poll where this says uh, we still have a trait, so it's still nice and uh, we can implement it for a bunch of types. And then this signature, I'll just suffice to say, it does support virtual dispatch. So we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that type parameter F or anything. But then the key thing here is uh, ha happening is the actual protocol around was ac what's actually being returned. So this option type that was returned, it can represent either none with nothing else or some with one particular value, like that item in the future. So we'll say that a none value says that a feature is not ready yet. We're not ready to make progress, and so you're gonna have to come back at a later date. If you receive some, then okay, we're now a resolved feature, here's the item, and you can't use the feature anymore. But the key thing is that if we see none, we need to know when to come back again and try again. So we know that this feature is not ready yet, but we, don't, we need to know precisely when it will be ready because we don't wanna just sit there polling it as that's just a bunch of busy waiting and not actually going to make an efficient server.
So we, we ended up building this kind of uh, layered protocol, kind of like con implicit contract around this poll function, saying that we know that features are owned by tasks, and we know that this one task is persistent for the lifetime of kind of everything in this one unit. So what we can say is that the task is the one that needs to be realized, that actually needs to realize when the feature is ready to go. The task is then going to uh, accommodate that it's actually going to pull it and continue to make progress. So not only does none mean I'm not ready, but it also has this implicit contract saying that I'm going to notify you when I otherwise would be ready. So that's kind of like the, the magic of how this poll function works and how this kind of simple signature ends up building up these real, uh, quite efficient features. But to show you an example, I want to dive into kind of how we would implement the poll function for a simple feature like a timeout where this is a feature where it's just gonna wait for some period of time, it's kinda like a sleep, but it's like an asynchronous sleep, where it doesn't literally block the thread, it just takes some time to actually resolve. So we'll say there's two fields here, the first of which is just when our timeout is gonna fire. This instant is just a point in time saying that this is the point at which point before which we will not be resolved and after which we will have become resolved and you can just pull a unit value out of this feature. This timer is just some fictitious library support. We're not gonna worry so much about that here, but it basically gives us the ability to run something at a later date. So we can just say, I would like to run this piece of code at this particular point in time, and you can just assume this is managed internally and kind of have some separate thread maybe, but is efficiently implemented. So we'll start off by saying, we'll implement the future trait for our timeout type. The type parameter here, or the type here, the item is just a unit. We're not actually gonna, we're not gonna pull anything out of this feature. It's just going to become resolved. It's just going to say I am resolved and we won't actually get any, any data associated with that. We'll start by filling in this implementation by saying, okay, if we have, a la like if the timeout has elapsed, like if we are actually done now at this point, then we will return some, saying, okay, the feature has resolved. We have waited an appropriate amount of time. We're ready to go. But the trickiness comes here in terms of how do we actually implement this if we're not ready yet and we need to somehow return none. And so remember, we have to make sure that the current task is ready to receive a notification when it otherwise would be ready. So we'll do that with this task current and this task notify function. Start off by saying, okay, we'll pull the current task, looking at the futures crate, and then we'll use our library support to say when the timeout is ready, we're going to send a not notification saying that now we are ready. So the key thing here is that this none value means that I am now going to actually notify you when my future would otherwise be ready, which in this case means for our timeout struct when the timeout has elapsed, and so we're just saying run that notify function when the timeout has elapsed after that period in time. So all right, uh, taking back a look again at the constraints we set out for ourselves, the first, thing, the first two things we said was this has to be a trait and this has to be virtually dispatchable. So naturally, what, we, what we've con converged on at this point is indeed a trait, does indeed support virtual dispatch. So these two, these two constraints are nice and solved at this point. Now we've also been saying though that this needs to be very cheap. This needs to have uh, very cheap state transitions, very cheap uh, transitions between all the aspects of the features here. And that was primarily driven with these tasks where every time we look at it, the state transition is governed by notifying that task by figuring out how to manage that task itself. It turns out that acquisition of the current task is actually very easy to do. It tends to just bump a reference count, kind of just increment the reference count of that arc. And notification is very similar as well. It's just kind of enqueuing a piece of data and kind of putting it on some separate thread to execute for a while. So namely, these two operations are indeed very cheap. We're kind of leveraging that persistent data, kind of how it's been, uh, the task is always tracking that feature at any one point in time. And so sure enough, the state transitions here are now an order of magnitude cheaper than they were before, as we could see with the giant graph there earlier. Now the final thing we wanted to solve here was this thread safety aspect where we wanted it to be thread safe when necessary but not actually incur any costs when it was not thread safe. And so we can do that by saying that the tasks themselves which are routing all those notifications are indeed sendable across threads, but that's the only thing. The features themselves never, never need to be sendable. They, they can just be routing notifications from other remote threads. So indeed we, have, we, we, we solve these constraints. The future trait itself has no unnecessary synchronization or kind of no extra synchronization layered on. And then the tasks are indeed allowing you to kind of source notifications and actually execute this on multiple threads concurrently. So all right, that's kind of a brief-ish overview of how features in Rust are working, kind of how they're implemented underneath the hood. But the last thing that I want to talk about is how we're actually routing these notifications into features themselves. So how, we're, uh, how Tokyo is implemented in the sense of 
we have this EPOL system, we have this IOCP system, and we have all these features that have all these task notifications, but we need to match these up to make sure the program is actually making progress. So in Tokyo, literally everything is a feature from top to bottom. You'll find everything in the stack is a feature from that reading TCP bytes all the way to writing TCP bytes. Everything there was powered by features all the way up and down which we've empowered by making these state transitions, making these common operations between features so cheap, we don't have this typical overhead you see from features in other languages, and so we can, we can ever leveraging this abstraction across the entire stack. Features, however, they will have to say, okay, I need to actually wait for some IO, I need to wait for uh, some TCP sockets, I need to, to, to wait for that, and Tokyo's gonna figure out how to actually route all that internally. So inside of Tokyo, we're gonna have the same aspect of async IO with, that we saw well, originally that kind of the system fundamentally gives us, where we'll try and read some data and Tokyo will immediately say, oh, that's gonna, that's gonna block and so I'm not actually gonna do anything at that point. But like with the future trait where you poll and you saw that you're not ready yet, there's this implicit contract here as well saying that if you tried to read some data and you're not ready yet, you've implicitly registered your global task to be routed to, uh, to get notified when you otherwise would receive some data. So it's very similar to the poll protocol, only it's kind of IO based as well. Kind of we're ho hooking into the IO system saying when you do IO and it's not ready, I'll be notified when it otherwise would be ready. And that's kind of effectively how ePoll works where you get a notification saying your Slack is not readable and then you'll get a notification later saying that, oh, now it is readable and you can continue to go work with that. So we're representing these two things with traits. We have the async read and the async write trait. And this colon syntax here means super trait and or just inherits from. And so the async read trait uses the read trait from the standard library internally saying that all, all it basically gives you is the ability to read into a buffer from an object. Write just says write that buffer into yourself. And so these are effectively though just marker traits, just kind of a, a static distinction saying that this IO object is features aware. It has this implicit protocol where it's non-blocking and when it would block, it's going to register your task to receive some sort of notification that it has been ready, is ready to go after that. So an example of how you implement this is kind of, how, this is uh, under the hood in the Tokyo Crates itself, where first up we say that um, we, we'll, we'll, we'll actually check to see if we're readable. If we're not readable, then we can just re return immediately and that's internally actually registering, re registering interest. But we'll actually read, once we've read, read some data, if the kernel says it's not readable, then we're gonna say, okay, let's actually block our task on this and say that we need to, we need to wait, or we need to, as part of our protocol, because we're returning not ready, actually register ourselves to receive notification at a later date. So this basically means that now we have summed all this up where this original thing that the kernel was giving us, which we had no idea what to do with, Tokyo now says precisely, oh, I know exactly how to match that up to a task because that previous task read from file descriptor four or five and said that it was not readable and so now, now I know precisely what to do given these notifications from the kernel and how to write all, write all that internally. So to wrap all this up, uh, Tokyo's event loop is effectively the actual thing that's responsible for now blocking your thread. The Tokyo event loop will kind of wait for all those events and then dispatch all, all, all of them internally and make progress in all the various features and whatnot. And then uh, the overall, it's kind of like a glorified translating kernel, no kernel notifications to task notifications in the, in the future system. So all right, that is uh, the concurrency aspect of Rust today, both the shared memory in terms of parallelism and kind of multiple cores and whatnot, as, as well as the async aspect of kind of having concurrent tasks on, on, on one particular core. There's a few links here. The book is probably the best place to get started if you're brand new to Rust. Uh, the, we have a users forum just for asking questions and whatnot. And if you're more curious about the async IO stack, uh, you might want to start there as kind of the, the current library for features. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, people, can you do like woohooing? Do you know what woohooing is? It's like woohoo. Okay, give me a good one on, on three. One, two, three. Thank you, that was very nice. Now I'm going to ask you uh, three questions, Alex, if, if you're okay with that. We, we've got some time. So these are from, from our website. Question number one is very short. Can you use two mutexes to achieve deadlock? Yes, so Rust guarantees you data race freedom. It does not guarantee you deadlock or race condition freedom. In Rust, you still have race conditions, you still have deadlocks. 
we actually attempted to have deadlock freedom, but it did not work out. And suffice to say, though, that it, you can have, we don't do any extra static analysis there. Once you have two mutexes, you can deadlock. Two channels, you can deadlock. You can have race conditions where you ordered your condition variable correctly and you blocked forever. That's all still possible in Rust. Question number two, how cheap is creation of threads or spawns in Rust in comparison with coroutines? Is it like based on Linux threads? A good question, actually, I forgot to mention this, which is that when you use the std thread module, when you actually create a thread, it's an OS thread. We do nothing else there. You're going straight to the system, you're calling pthread create, and the only extra cost is we need to box up that closure and put it on the heap to actually transfer to the new thread. But otherwise, it's the exact same thing as an OS thread. So there's no, it's, however cheap your OS thread is compared to a coroutine, it's exactly that. And number three was, could you answer uh, Rafael's former question, what is the song that you secretly like but are ashamed to admit? Uh, I think that would probably be most of Lady Gaga's songs. I have a, a soft spot for those, which I'm slightly embarrassed of. Alex, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Just a quick reminder, Alex will be back. I mean, I now understand why you like time travel movies, because the second talk is like an example of time travel. So you had coroutines first and then only um, after, which is what, tomorrow, 4.15, room 9, there will be intro to Rust here. Yeah, very interesting take. Um, other than that, we've got a little gift for you, Alex. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you. I invite everybody to come back later tomorrow. Yeah, do it properly. One, two, three, go. Thank you.